Yes, Mr. Bond. Now that PyTorch is installed on everyone's computers, I can enact my master plan. GPU acceleration for normal integration. Welcome to SETI Astro. As always, if you don't have the newest release yet, head over to SETIAstro.com under Astro Program, SETI Astro Suite Pro, version 1.3. Uh, the download here is to the GitHub page, the mirror sites for the Google Drive, and I've also updated my white paper to include uh, some of the things we'll be talking about today as well. So we got to talk about the, the new stuff here in Stacking Suite. In the wrench now, you're going to see a checkbox to use hardware acceleration if available. And everybody's been asking, when are we going to be able to use GPUs for integrating our images? Well, now. now now's the day. So when you get to the point in your stacking, when it actually has to do the integration, that bit can take quite a long time. And now that's going to put all that math onto the GPU to run it a lot faster. Things like aligning stars, normalization, a lot of those things are still CPU uh, driven, but GPUs are really, really good at vectorized and matrix style math. And that's perfect for the actual integration math where we're doing the uh, averaging, the rejection, those all that math uh, for the stack of your images. Now that's going to go to the GPU and just have that run full bore on your integration. So let's go ahead and check out that first before we get into uh, image MM and the full implementation of it now. So I'm going to just have uh, nothing checked except for auto accept measured reference. Uh, this will just be so it doesn't have the pop up for you to verify the reference frame. If you just trust that it's going to pick your reference frame, uh, just leave that check and it's just going to run full bore. So I'm just going to go ahead and register and integrate my images. And when we get to that portion where it's going to move things over to the GPU, I'll uh, hop back on and we'll look at it. All right, the uh, alignment just finished, and now you can see that my GPU is just going crazy as we're going to start integrating our tiles. It says uh, the mode is GPU, and the first tile is done, and it's just moving on to the next one. It'll even tell you a little uh, summary, you know, how many seconds it took to do that tile and approximately how many megapixels per second uh, the GPU was able to calculate. And there we go. It's done with the integration. It frees up the memory in your GPU now as well. And it's it's done. So it's a heck of a lot faster during the integration phase uh, because it puts all that on the GPU. And I know a lot of people have been waiting a long time for somebody to do this. And I'm glad it's in City S Suite Pro now. Now with that out of the way, we could talk about the rest of the options here. You're going to see now for uh, the image MM, it doesn't say beta anymore because now we got all the extra options in here. You're going to want to keep it on Huber loss. Uh, L2 is just a straight L2 loss. Negative 2 is what's recommended in the paper again. If you march this closer to zero, it's going to allow it to uh, be less aggressive. Right? Because the, that's, that's where the loss changes from a quadratic loss to a linear loss. So as you get closer and closer to zero more and more of your pixels will be in the linear loss stage, so it won't be as aggressive. Negative two seems to work for, for most things. You're also gonna see a minimum and a maximum iterations because it can early out if your images are really clean. You can set a minimum number of iterations to be like three or five, just to make sure it gets enough iterations in to, to really let image MM develop. But Importantly, you're going to see auto star mask and auto noise map now. These are the star mask and noise variation maps that are used in the original paper. And I've also updated my white paper to talk about the star, the star mask and variation mapping, how that fits into the math, and uh, kind of the, you know, the write-up of what these are, how they're done, where they fit into the process. I've updated the, the code mapping. The plain English overview has that in there as well. And then again with the, the block diagram. Now if you go into the stacking suite settings, you're going to see a lot a lot more settings in here now. Just, just in general. Lots going on. But for the multi-frame deconvolution, this is the image MM. The star detection, that's going to be for your star mask, the initial sigma threshold. If you find that it's finding tens of thousands of stars. You may want to start this higher at a sigma of five or 10 or more. Dilate is how many pixels around each star it finds to make a mask. And if you remember a, 
the ringing around stars is going to be bigger than the star. So uh, dilation of eight seems to be pretty good. Feathering just means uh, it softens the edge of that mask a little bit. There's a max star radius, so this way if it errantly detects something that's really big, that's obviously not a star, uh, it's just going to make sure that it doesn't include that in the mask. So you could adjust this if your stars and your image are really big, like maybe from a Celestron C8 SCT where the stars themselves are they're just bigger blobs. Um, you may want to adjust the max star radius up. The max stars kept in the mask. This is uh, ensuring that the brightest stars get masked without having, you know, 20,000 stars in the mask. You could adjust this as well. The keep floor Instead of having a zero or a one in the mask, this ensures that there's some minimum floor to the mask, make like a 0.1 or a 0.2 or a 0.3, such that the weight of those stars in the core still affect the image MM modeling. If you had this at a hard zero, none of the star cores would actually affect the weight of the model and throw the model off. So 0.1, 0.2, somewhere in there is usually pretty good. The ellipse scale, you could leave just at 1.2. That's just how much it's going to um, include the ellipticity of the stars in there. And then the, the next couple ones are for the noise variation map. So to get, the, uh, to get a smooth map and not take a whole lot of time, we're going to sample, you know, like sections. So every essentially every eight sections across it, every eight pixels, it's going to be doing the sampling. There's a certain amount of smoothing it does on the map itself. Otherwise it'll be really pixelated and you don't want that for a noise variation map. You want the variation map to uh, vary smoothly across the map itself. And then the uh, map noise floor, this is in a log scale. 1E e negative eight is, is plenty good. You don't wanna really go much below that. Uh, and so this is just going to help the image MM when it's updating its model to downweight the areas with more noise in your image. So really dark areas that have a lot of noise, you don't want that actually influencing the model a whole lot. So that's that's the point of the noise variation map. Obviously, the star mask is just to mask around the stars such that the updates don't include a lot of ring on these stars that you could see if you're if you're extra aggressive. So I'm just going to click OK. And let's go ahead and run these now. Let's have a star mask on, the auto noise map on, and I'll just uh, kind of walk through what's happening over in the console over here. So the first step is going to be just the normal registration and alignment and normalization. What version 1.3 also does is it will allow for mixed binning. If you have bin two and bin one and bin three all together, it's going to ensure that they're all at the same bin, usually one by one scale, uh, to do all this. This includes both normal integration, MFD convolution, comets, whatever. It's going to ensure that all your bins are compatible with each other. So you could use mixed binning now as well. All right, now the alignment is done. We're getting into uh, the second phase where ImageMM is really going to start doing everything. It has to measure the PSFs of every frame, which was already getting done. But now it's also creating the star masks and noise variation mapping. And you can see that hope happening over in here, how many stars it detected, how many it's kept, drawn, uh, how many pixels are going to be masked, all those kind of things. And then for the variation map, it has the median, the RMS median. If your Fitz header has gain and read noise, it's actually going to utilize them as well. And then just to make sure that things are above the floor, it's clipping to the floor, right? And in my case, none of my noise is uh, at, at the floor because 1 times 10 to the negative 8th is an extremely low noise floor that I have in here. But it's just to ensure that you don't have a zero popping up anywhere. So this will be the new thing if you have these uh, checked where the PSF builds are going to be slower because this is where it's actually creating the star masks and the noise variation mapping. All right, it's just finishing up building all the different star masks and noise variation maps, including, uh, you know, all the subweight PSFs. And now it's going to calculate our seed image just like before. But importantly, now when it's using the image MM recursion modeling, it's going to be able to utilize those masks and noise variation maps in the model itself. The seed image is finished calculating, and now it's going to start the multiplicative updates. 
And now after it's gone through a bit of uh, overhead updates to get the data right, it sends it over to the GPU and gets the GPU started with the uh, iterations. And if I quickly pull up the task manager here, you can see that the, the GPU's memory has gone way up and it's getting fully utilized. You're gonna see the GPU get used for a couple different things, creating the FFTs at first. So you'll see that uh, utilization kind of go up and down. And then once it gets into the actual recursion after the FFTs are built, then it's just gonna be pretty much a, a steady, steady 100% utilization until the process is finished with the iterations. Again, as it finishes its iterations, it's going to update this here. And this is out of the maximum. So you may see it only go to four or five and then it gets its early stop and uh, exits out. And now even if it doesn't early out, it'll tell you how many iterations it used. It also won't overwrite the old file name, which was a problem before. So it'll be sensitive to that as well. So let's, let's check it out now. The great thing about running these back to back is now we can compare them directly with a normal stack and with the image MM stack. And you should be able to see even on YouTube, just the, the difference here in what is softer, what is sharper, what has more detail, what has more stuff in it and how they directly compare. The other question I got a lot um, is, yeah, the, the noise looks different, but a lot of that is just due to the auto stretch since noise levels will affect the amount of auto stretch and the image MM allows for the darker darks to happen as well versus the, the normal stack. But a lot of the questions I got were in regards to using blur exterminator and noise exterminator and if doing image MM first would be more beneficial even if you're going to be using those tools. So I have them both opened up here in Pix Insight. I'm gonna run uh, just Noise Exterminator on both on the default settings, and then I'm gonna go ahead and run Noise Exterminator again, both just on the default settings so we can have an apples to apples. And now they're random both, and I'm gonna let the, the results just speak for themselves. The amount of detail in the image MM BlurX NoiseX versus the normal stack BlurX NoiseX is just markedly different. There is much more detail. There's sharper contrasts. Like here's a really good spot where you just see the normal stack is just so much softer across the board and it's missing a lot of this fainter detail that's out in here now that image MM allows you to capture, especially in areas like this. Here we could zoom right up in here and you could see the level of detail is just different between the two. Image MM provides th tools like BlurX and NoiseX more and better data at the start in order to let them achieve even better results. And here's, a, here's another great spot where the contrast down in these darker areas and everything, just so much more. And the detail, there's just detail in here all over the place that just does not exist from the normal stack. Some people have also told me they don't see a big difference between image MM and normal stacking yet. I think people are underestimating how big of a deal this is. For 20 years, we've been stacking images the exact same way. This is a fundamentally different process that yields better results on average than a normal stack. And these are early days with this process. People are going to come out with way better improvements to this. This is fundamentally, I think, going to change the way we stack going forward. And I think it's just an amazing time to get in on the ground floor and see the, see the results here of what ImageMM can do to set you up with a better image to go into your post-processing than what normal stacking can achieve. And if you want to head over to my Discord, we have plenty of users over here that are already experimenting around with ImageMM. Here, here is a, here's a great one that was actually captured by one individual and then processed by another using ImageMM. Just a gorgeous tool up here, a lot of detail in and amongst here. Like I said, exciting times to get in on the ground floor and really start experimenting around with this fundamentally new way to stack images. Please comment, like, and subscribe.